Welcome to another exciting podcast of Royal Oak Victory Church. We're glad you've joined us. We are a community devoted to God, connected to others, and influencing our world. Anyway, last Sunday we began a brand new series called Always Ready. Always Ready. And it's really taken from one verse of Scripture. Uh, it's, uh, it's one of my favorite verses in the Bible, in fact. It's, it's in 1 Peter 3.15, uh, where, first Pete, where Peter tells us, he, 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 he says here, he says, um, but, but sanctify the Lord God in your heart. We talked about that last week, what that means. Uh, That means uh, putting God first, not just on Sundays or Wednesday nights, but every day of our lives. Uh, Through the easy times and the difficult times, uh, we sanctify the Lord in our heart. We called it living, living for Christ. And then Peter goes on to say, and always be ready to give. And so the first principle is living it. And then, of course, the second principle is giving it. And he tells us here what we're to give. Always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you. Okay, and so we talked about that last week, how important it is for us to live and give. And the kind of giving it's talking about here is a giving where you give answers to people who ask you about the hope that is in you. And I talked about it last Sunday, that sometimes just blanket uh, Christianese answers aren't the best way to do it, right? Dead-end answers, like the Bible says so, or I was raised that way, or that's what the pastor preached on Sunday, is not the best way to answer. Many of the questions that non-Christians are asking today, even Christians. And so we thought it would be a great idea, and we've never done this before, um, if, uh, if, if we could answer some of the questions. Now, the questions... Uh, are going to come from this crowd right here. Turn to the person next to you, say he's counting on you. Just say, okay. Okay, so, so w- w- we want you to come up with questions, questions, any questions about the Bible, um, you know, about the Christian faith, about church, about spirituality. You know, we don't want questions about where's the best place you feel to buy shoes or things like that. Um, we want to kind of kind of narrow it into spirituality, Bible questions. And the way it's going to work, this is going to be quite exciting. We've never done this before, uh, but we want you to text in your questions. Now, we're going to have a panel come up here in a minute, and I'm going to introduce the panel. But you text your questions to ROVC, and then your question... Two three nine three nine three nine. Okay, does that make sense? So you put in ROVC, then a space, then your question to three nine three nine three nine. What's going to happen is we're going to pick that question up, and it will go to our uh, our tech desk there at the back, and then they have a way of letting us know what that question is. How many think that's pretty exciting? Yeah. It's awesome, yeah. And so we did practice this on Thursday. Everything worked fine. Uh, And we're hoping it works uh, fine uh, today as well. So I want you to be thinking of a question right now, maybe questions that have stumped you in the past, because we have a panel of experts here today. And I'm going to ask our panel to come. Why don't we give them a big hand as they come? And rather than me uh, introducing them, uh, what I'd like to do is I'm just going to have them introduce themselves a little bit, uh, how long they've been coming to the church, and uh, sort of where they serve here at ROVC or where they've served in the past. And so don't they look like a great bunch? Okay. And so why don't we start with you on this end? Uh, I probably don't need much of an introduction. Um, my name is Pastor Sheldon. I'm one of the pastors here at the church, and I have been coming uh, for about nine years uh, since at the time my uh, girlfriend dragged me to this church, um, and I knew I wasn't going to get out of it because she was the youth pastor. Um, so that's how I uh, started attending nine years ago, and uh, I've been on staff for almost nine years, and uh, that's, and I'm 
Calgary, born and raised, so that's just, I'm a, I'm a rarity, so I'll, I'll add that on to the end. Uh, my name is William. Um, I've been attending ROVC for about three years now. I serve in greeters, ushers, and I also teach um, a connect group uh, on apologetics. Uh, we do that in the spring. So if you've taken my class, thank you for coming out again. Uh, I also just finished my first year of seminary, getting my master's in theology. So um, getting equipped for serving God in any other ways he has. Awesome. Uh, my name is Dennis Defoe. I'm also from Calgary, born and raised, Crescent Heights High School. Yeah. And uh, You got some fans here. Yeah. The, uh, the Cowboys. Yeah. I um, have gone through Bible college. I've got my bachelor's. I have been in pastoral ministry for a couple decades. I've been at this church for my wife. I just sold me four years. And uh, right now I'm a chaplain at a, a men's homeless shelter. And in the addictions program, we do a lot of classes, and one of them is geared towards kind of what we're talking about here, so um, it should be fun. Yes. Well, should be. Well, let's give our panel a big hand again. And, of course, everyone knows me. Let me just say that I am also Calgary born and raised and Ernest Manning High School. Oh, well. I thought I'd give it a try. <laughs> okay, so we are, uh, we're going to prime the pump. We do have one question that we thought of ourselves because we know it'll take time for you to text your questions in. And, um, and so the question is, is how do we know that God exists? And so, um, you know, maybe I'll just start with, with Dennis and maybe you just want to just capsulize on that. Well, to start off, the most basic part of the idea of God comes down to the fact that there is a creation. Uh, our best science is now more and more understanding that there's a beginning. And if there's a beginning to the universe or a beginning to the multiverse, which also had to have had a beginning, it just pushes the problem backwards, is that the creator had to be someone immaterial, timeless, uh, benevolent. What's the other ones I'm looking for there? So he has to be immaterial because we have a material universe. He has to be spaceless. He has to be timeless because he began before time. So there's, there's a being, and it's not just a cold being because the, there was a will involved to create. There's a choice involved which made him personal. And the fact that there's something made that is life-giving makes him benevolent. So there's, once you go past the question that goes to the question, you find that there's no scientific answer. There's something greater than science to answer that question. And so that would be where I would start with the idea that God exists because there's no other reasonable answer that meets that criteria. I, I, would, uh, I would second that. Um, but first I would start with the caveat, and then you can't 100% prove that God exists. It's essentially like a scale of justice. And does the evidence for God's existence outweigh the existence or the non-existence? And I would say yes, it does. Dennis touched on the cosmological argument where we look at how the cosmos were formed. Uh, we have scientific evidence now to back that up. Einstein's theory of general relativity, expansion of the universe, uh, all of those help frame the argument that the, cos the cosmos were designed by something beyond space and time. Um, there's other arguments you can look at, uh, for example, look at our DNA, look at the way that we are designed. Um, that is a host, or sorry, that is a, um, an avenue where you can look at intelligent design and say that something intelligent had to program us, something had to encode DNA in us, something had to put it in a language that is discernible. Uh, every time we go to Ikea and you get something uh, that you have to build, it's done in one of those languages. And intelligent design is one of those avenues that we can use uh, through, obviously, the programming, the enabling, and the, um, the decoding. Yeah, and then I would just talk about it from a, uh, I guess, from a pastoral perspective, although um, all this stuff is, is absolutely true. It's fun when you dig into the science stuff, especially physics. Um, but uh, one of the things that I like, oh, one argument I really like is the, the morality argument and the fact that uh, there had to have been something that defined good and evil. Good and evil just doesn't define itself. Uh, so there has to be a standard uh, that was put in place um, by something or someone. Uh, and so we say that that standard or that morality uh, exists because God exists. 
uh, because he is love. It doesn't say he created love, he is love. So that creates that, that standardized argument. But I think, too, it comes down to uh, what William said in terms of like the scales of justice. Uh, many of us in this room have had personal experiences uh, with God that could only be defined as a relationship with Jesus. Uh, things like miracles and faith uh, and those type of stories aren't just stories in the Bible. There are realities for many of us. Uh, that we can't explain. And one of the things I love the most is when you go into a hospital and the doctor can't explain it, and right away I know, yeah, I can. Um, and so for me, I really like the morality argument, which is one of, the, I think, the four main arguments um, that really helps define why God exists. Wonderful. Okay, another question is, how do you hear from God? And that, that's a great question. Uh, because we understand that our ability to succeed in life is directly related to us finding God's path, and yet finding God's path is linked to us being able to hear Him. And so, uh, William, do you want to start us off with that one? It's a tough question, because um, I think everybody's different. Um, Obviously, now that, uh, now that we're in the church age, the, the best way to hear from God is through the Word. Um, but, but I think all of us, like Pastor Sheldon was saying, have that unique experience where we've encountered Him on a more personal level. Um, f like, do you want to know me personally as well? Yeah, well, why don't you share personally, and then we can touch on uh, just some of the, um, the principles of hearing God. So, sure. Uh, I think uh, for me, it's, it's that... Um, it's that feeling in your, in your body that you're following the right, uh, the right course of action that he's got for you. Um, you're asking the right questions in prayer and meditation time. You're getting into the word, and if, and if something contradicts the word, well, you know that's not the right way to go. Um, but really, it's, getting, it's building that relationship with God so that you can hear his voice, either through the word, through others, the elders and the pastors of the church. He'll speak to them through them, family and friends, that sort of thing. Um, and then, and then following that inkling that you have. I mean, all of us have some understanding of what is right and what is wrong. Uh, it's fine-tuning that to say, is this what God wants me to do or is this what God wants me to do? And I think Hebrews 11.6, you got to take a step in faith, and without faith, you can't, you can't please Him. Mm -hmm. So even, even if you don't know if it's the right course of action, you're taking that step out in faith, and He's going to either correct you or continue, allow you to continue on that journey. Okay. Wonderful. Dennis, uh, anything more on that? The, the, the principles I see both with what, you know, personally I've felt and just it seems like in the Old Testament the Bible would have someone speak something, and I think the Word, of course, is now our, our end result, but there is the conviction of the Holy Spirit, which sometimes is different than the mor morals of our day. And that's the one thing I think is different about God is that it's not always going to be what is popular. The, the conviction of the Holy Spirit, the confirmation of the brethren, I know for myself and my calling that there was a confirmation of a calling. And so I think God uses all those venues to bring us to a place to say, i got to go and take a step and see if I'm actually hearing them or not. And so I think that's another, just another aspect as well. Okay. Um, we? Yeah, the only thing I would add on that is it, um, just one thing that I've had recently is because this is a... Uh, a conversation I've had to have with my daughter because she comes uh, to me and she says, uh, Dad, I can't hear God. And right away, I have to correct her on that and say, no, we can all hear God. God is speaking all the time. It's a matter of whether or not we're listening or not. Uh, and many of the ways that we listen have been highlighted here, but I think part of it is we have to change that attitude that it isn't about us being able to hear, it's us being able to listen. Uh, and many times what that means is that we've just got to silence ourselves, um, silence our brains, silence our emotions, and just get alone with God so that we can hear what He's saying because He's always speaking. Uh, and so that, for me, is one of the things um, that I would add on to what's been said. Yeah. Wonderful. And, of course, um, you know, I like to just uh, throw in a few things. I, I always look at it as, as three C's. You had two. I, got, I actually have four C's. Um, you know, the first C is conscience. So God has given all of us a conscience. And um, whether we're spiritual or unspiritual, whether we're young or old, we all have a conscience. We know when we do something right and we know when we do something wrong. I have two little granddaughters and I'm telling you, they know when they do something wrong. Um, you can see it by the look on their face. Uh, when I walk in the room and they've 
eaten three cookies that they weren't supposed to. So that, that, that's conscience. The other C is creation. And so, you know, just the fact that we have a world around us, just the fact that when we go out to Banff or to the mountains, you know, it says the heavens declare the glory of God. And how we respond to, to creation will let God know whether we're seeking him or not. If we look at a mountain and say, well, you know, um, you know or, or a bird or, or, or a living organism and say, well, you know, that thing was evolved. It has nothing to do with God. That's blocking the voice of God. Of course, the third C is Christ. That's the loudest voice of all, the one who changed history forever. The fact that God came in the flesh as Jesus, and he was the word um, incarnate. In other words, so he is the Bible. Uh, that is the fourth. So, so the reality is, or the third, the reality is, is how we respond to the person of Christ. And then, of course, the, the last C is community. And uh, you guys have shared a little bit about that. Um, as, as far as getting guidance from people around us. I just want to say that how we respond to the light that's given us determines whether we get more light. How we response, respond when our conscience is pricked, how we respond when we see God in nature. Uh, every time we respond in a positive way, God gives us more light, more light, more light, and his voice can get louder. So uh, that's... Uh, that's that question there, yeah. You know, we got another question. Um, what would happen to someone who died right after Christ died in a part of the world where they had never heard about Jesus? So who wants to start that one off? I, Go ahead, Dan. I, The way that salvation has happened has always been the same. It's always been grace and faith. And sometimes we think that there was a, a big difference between before the cross and after. And there was some big differences in the way that it, it, it bore out in a society. But God has always been witnessing to his creation. He was, his biggest confirmation and light in the Old Testament was through a nation because there was not very many people on the planet. And the biggest thing is one of the, I think one of the reasons the timing of Christ came was because of the population explosion, the urbanized, all these things that God knew was going to happen. But God has always been reaching out to every single person he created and loved before they were mourned, and he was calling out to them. And the light that they were given and the light that they responded to would have been the revelation that was necessary. And so um, whether they, in the Old Testament, they understood the word Christ, it was still that reality of that relationship, that it was the true God, and that there was a relationship coming from the light that they were truly chasing after and God was revealing to them. So that's just my aspect. Sometimes we complicate that reality that there's something really big difference, but God's always been the same way. It's been by His grace and through a faith relationship. I would echo that. And, um, you know, you, you, you talk about people who, who were in Israel or, or, or Judea before Christ died. There was still that faith that came from the promises of the, of the prophets, that God would send somebody to save them. Uh, so there was that faith that they based in, and that was, that was categorized by God as faith in Christ. Um, for those cultures who never hear of it, um, I believe that God judges us based upon the revelation that he gives us. So whether that's through the universe and looking at the cosmos and seeing something had to have designed that, that's the light that God is bringing into that, uh, that community, that culture. And he's going to judge those people based upon his revelation to that individual. Yeah, the only thing I would um, add on there is a story I know of, of um, some missionaries going into a tribe in South America. Uh, I believe it was in Brazil. Um, but I know for sure it was South America, and the missionaries went in, they got to learn the language, and they started asking about the, the faith and the religion of that tribe. Um, and the missionaries were shocked. Basically, they knew the gospel in and out, but they had never actually heard the story of Jesus. All the, the only thing they didn't have was actually the name of Jesus. Uh, but the, the story, the revelation, how faith came through, uh, a belief in one God. Um, it was the first time missionaries had ever seen basically a perfect understanding of the gospel. All they had to do was insert the name of Jesus. Uh, and so that whole tribe was basically already saved. Um, but it was through a special revelation of God. And that's the thing, we can't limit God or understand even God's judgment, um, like William said, because we're not in that position. Um, and I think we just have to have the faith that God knows what he's doing in, in those cultures that haven't yet had a chance 
maybe to hear the personal message of Jesus, um, but I don't think there's any reason to believe that uh, there aren't people out there uh, that have come to their own revelation uh, through uh, the Holy Spirit. Okay, wonderful. Okay, the next question is, is this. Is Jesus, the Holy Spirit, and God the same thing? So um, I'll just throw that out there, whoever wants to jump in first. Yeah, so um, I would answer the question yes and no, but let me clarify why. Um, Jesus, God, and the Holy Spirit are all God, and that's the first thing we have to understand. But again, we are probably talking about one of the most difficult things to understand in Christian theology, uh, and that is the concept of the Trinity, uh, the fact that we have one God in three persons. Uh, so we don't worship three different gods. We don't worship uh, a polytheistic type system. There is only one God, um, but he reveals himself in three different ways. And each aspect, uh, you can actually, sometimes the term is called a triune God, uh, because there's three in unity with one another, but they all reveal themselves in different aspects. God himself is revealed as God the Father, and the Father has different characteristics than Jesus the Son, uh, and also different characteristics from the Holy Spirit, and each function in different ways, uh, and each have a different purpose within creation and within our lives, uh, but we do have to understand uh, the fact that we are only worshiping one God. Anybody else? Let's take one more answer on that. Uh, just the fact that uh, there's a, some people think it's a contradiction that there's three who's and one who, but th that's the difference is that there's one what and three who's. Mm -hmm. And so that God, each one is divine. The essence of God and divinity is in all of them, but the personality, the who-ness is the separation of the three. Okay. And so just like water uh, is in three parts, liquid, solid, when it's ice, gas, um, although it's still water, it's expressed in three forms. God is, is one God expressed in three forms. One God, three forms. Father, Holy Spirit, and the Son, Jesus. Uh, you know, the next question is, and this is, this is always a whopper, um, if God created everything, uh, did he also create evil? I want this one. Evil. Okay. <laughs> He's chomping at um, the bit here. God didn't create evil because evil doesn't exist as a thing. Evil is a negation or the abuse of what is. All that has been created, that's why we know God's benevolent, and that's the, whoever created the universe is benevolent, because whatever is, exists, whatever is made is good. Crea evil is a leech or a, an abuse of that which is. So when you have, for instance, let's take cannabis or hemp. You can make a nice sweater, you can make good medicine, you can make good rope, but if you take it and, and smoke it, you start to abuse it, and it harms people. And so everything God has made is good. Evil is something that is a leech and a non-existent f abuse of what God has made. For an example, if I were to tell you that my name is Dave Myers and I'm the pastor of this church, where's the reality in that statement? It doesn't exist. A lie does not exist. And evil doesn't exist in the same way. It's an abuse of something. If I were to tell you that I'm, I'm a millionaire, it just doesn't exist. And so it, it's not there. I can tell you something. I can twist what's really there. But evil in itself doesn't exist. There's always been good. Evil comes from the idea that God gave us free will to choose other than what it was meant to be used for. Yeah, I'd, I would have added free will had Dennis not done that. Um, so I think... I think God doesn't create evil. The mechanism by which evil is fostered is obviously within his creation, but through the free will, we then are making those choices to do good or evil. Yeah, so, so basically God is sovereign. Uh, he's all-powerful. Uh, but for some reason, uh, God has allowed evil. He didn't create evil. He has allowed evil. And God is so powerful, so majestic, so almighty that God, at the end of the day, is going to be able to use evil for his good and his glory. And, and when you read the Bible from, Revelation, from Genesis to Revelation, God always takes evil, even though he didn't create it, and he turns it for his glory. And really, the cross is, is a perfect example of that. Uh, probably the most 
evil act uh, that ever occurred on earth, and there's been lots of them, has been the cross, uh, the crucifixion of Jesus. And yet God allowed it uh, and, 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 and permitted it, and yet the cross is, is the great, greatest triumph in all of human history. So. Okay, Amen. Can I add something, Dave? Uh, I would say also evil is, is something that, and I, maybe Dennis was highlighting this, is something that we foster in our minds. Um, in a sense, we can't define evil without knowing what is pure goodness. So for those of us who hold a Christian worldview, we understand evil versus good. We understand light versus dark. We know that there is a holy God that created everything, and that is the epitome. Those outside the Christian worldview, I can't wrap my head around why they determine things to be evil because they don't have that standard to look up to for what is good. So again, it comes down to maybe it's a philosophical human, human creation, but evil in our minds in, in, in this room, we have something to equate it to in good. Whereas the other side, those that are living outside, excuse me, the Christian worldview are, are really just grasping at straws. You know, they're saying, well, that's bad, that's evil. So then we have to turn the argument back on them. Well, what, what is good then? If you don't have a, sem a semblance of understanding what is good, how can you define something as evil? Yeah. Okay. Um, another question is, uh, how do you reconcile biblical truth with evolution? And um, we could be here for hours on this one, but we'll, we'll try and, and give our best uh, capsule on that. Uh, Sheldon, do you want to start? Sure. Um, part of it comes back to what Dennis said right at the very beginning, and that is the fact that uh, all of the scientific proof we have thus far, as, as they dive into greater and greater depths of physics, uh, it, it ends up causing more questions than answers. So really what that means is there has to be a starting point. Um, now, if we're talking about the broad strokes of evolution, if we go back to uh, the theory of evolution that came about because of Darwin, uh, one of the things we have to understand is that there were two major problems with his argument. Uh, the first pro pro problem with his argument is the fact that uh, one of the things people tried to do was they tried to prove uh, that this was true. And so what ended up happening is these scientists came out in England and they said, we've got proof. Uh, we found a human that kind of looks like a monkey and, and we've got the skeletal results and, and this is proof, this is truth. Um, and so that was published. What they didn't publish was the fact that they realized that what they had done is they had taken the skull of a monkey and the, uh, skele the rest of a skeleton of a human, shoved the two together, put it in the dirt, and, dis and then said they discovered it. Um, and the way they actually aged the skull to make it look like it was old is they left it in a vat of tea for three months. Um, but none of that was ever published. Uh, the other aspect of Darwin's theory that has a, a major flaw in it is the fact that what he's actually talking about is something called microevolution. And that is the aspect of evolution that things do change over time. Now the fact is, is that aspect of evolution is in fact true. And we can see that even through human culture. We are taller now than people were three or four hundred years ago. And that has to do with things like food changes, better health care, um, better shelter, different things like that that have allowed our bodies to adapt and grow taller. Um, that is what we would call microevolution. But these drastic jumps forward, these major leaps, there has never been scientific proof anywhere um, to, to prove that that is in fact the case. Um, the problem is, is they've taken a theory and they've said it's truth. And if you know anything about science, it's about asking a question and then proving the answer. Well, the fact is, is most scientists now have jumped past the question and just said that the answer is real when in fact they have no proof. Um, so they're disregarding basic scientific theory uh, just to kind of make that question work. Okay. Anybody else want to comment on that? Yeah, just the fact that um, they run out of a lot of a answers when they, the farther they go back, and they can't understand how a cell was formed because two things had to form at the same time. That goes against evolutionary thoughts. And so there's many of those little gaps. And so what you have in, in Darwinian evolution basically comes down to more faith than we have. And I'm serious. And so you have to have a leap of faith to believe that. And the reality is, there are Christians who believe in evolution. And if you think God did it that way, well, that's not the end of the world. But I, would, but I myself don't. 
I do believe in microevolution. I think God made us adaptable, beaks on birds, people that we do. But um, I see no, I've seen no evidence of speciation that we've changed from different species. And that microevolution would have to have been programmed. Again, we're coming back to intelligent design and, and God existing. When those cells um, uh, manipulate and adapt over time, that is, a, that is programmed within the DNA of that. So, and all of that had to be from the very beginning for that microevolution to occur, for that, that fish in the sea to be able to adapt to predators and feeding and all that sort of stuff. That was built into their DNA when, when God created everything as it is. Okay. Uh, the next question, I'm going to answer this one very briefly. Muslims say that uh, they believe in Jesus, so why are they not Christians? And of course, um, you know, G the name Jesus, Jesus is like the word automobile. Um, it, it, you can say the word and you get different things in your mind, right? Like right now I'm thinking of a red sports car that, that I really ought to buy. Um, and you might be thinking of a minivan. So the same thing with the word Jesus. Uh, just because people say they believe in Jesus doesn't mean they say uh, they're believing in the Jesus of the Bible. So as far as Muslims go, they believe in Jesus. They believe he was a great prophet. But one thing they do not believe is that he, he, he is the son of God, that he was God in the flesh, and that he died on the cross for our sins. So many Muslims believe what they call in the swoon theory. Okay? Jesus didn't die on the cross. He swooned on the cross, he was still alive, and then his disciples came and took him down off the cross, uh, replaced him with a thief or, or someone else, and that's who ended up in the tomb. So that is the huge difference. Muslims do believe in Jesus, uh, but not the Jesus of the Bible, not the, 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 the Jesus that we as Christians believe. Big difference. I'll add something, Dave. Um, the problem, the problem with, with Muslims claiming that uh, Jesus, or Isa in Arabic, was a prophet of God, is that they believe in a prophet that is quintessentially then a liar. Jesus came, stated in as many words as he could that he was the son of God. All the I am statements you read in John. So therefore, if we believe that Jesus was the son of God, crucified, resurrected, great. But with the Muslim belief in Jesus as a prophet, well, then they're negating what Jesus said throughout his pastoral ministry, and that was he was the son of God. So they make him out to be a prophet that's a liar, and a prophet can't be a liar. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so one of the best books on this, if you really want to do some discovery, is, is, is Seeking Allah, Finding Jesus fantastic book. I read it a couple months ago. It's a story of a devout Muslim who, uh, who was seeking Allah, wanting to know the truth, and at the end, he, uh, he ended up finding Jesus. And just the journey that he went on uh, through that, just fantastic read. And it really helps you understand the Muslim faith as well. Uh, the next question is, um, uh, I saw it there, how do dinosaurs fit into the history of creation? I'll take this one. <laughs> there's two schools of thought within the church. Um, there's your old age creationists, and then there's your young age, your young earth creationists. Uh, I myself am an old earth creationist, so I believe the scientific record, carbon dating, I believe the, the universe is billions and billions of years old. And then you've got this, this, the second school of thought within the church is New Age. And really it all comes down to the Hebrew word yom, which is day. And for me, yom is used in several, period, or several uh, aspects of the literary text that we would do the same thing. We look at day as 12 hours, we look at day as when the sun is shining, we look at day as a 24 hour period, we look at day as an eon. My grandfather used to say, back in my day, well, what does that mean? It means when he was younger, right? So it really comes down to your interpretation of the Hebrew word yom. So dinosaurs fit within my creation because I'm an old age creationist. So all of that can happen within my thought. Uh, and there, there, are, there, are, there is scriptural text for both sides of the argument. And um, Hebrews, they didn't just didn't use, they didn't know that we were gonna use that word dinosaur. So 
pity them, right? They should have known better. <laughs> so a dinosaur doesn't show up in the Bible because they didn't know we were going to use that word. But there are hints at creatures in the Bible that were huge, both on land and in the sea, whether you call it the Leviathan or the Behemoth. And there's arguments about what they were, but there's no exclusion of them, just that they don't describe them the same way we would want them to. And so it, it doesn't, uh, lack of evidence doesn't mean there's no evidence or the lack of the proper terminology. Mm -hmm. And so for, as a Calgarian, I think God made dinosaurs so we could have oil and be rich. <laughs> but that's, uh, <laughs> that's, that's it. Uh, and other people say, you know, Noah just forgot them, but I don't think so. I just want to add one quick thing on that. The argument goes in the other direction as well. Uh, and when you read the book of Revelation, uh, John had uh, a vision of what the future would look like. But when you're coming from that context, he's not going to know how to describe the things that now for us are easily understood. So let, I always use the example, if John were in his time were to see a helicopter, how would you describe that? Right? There's no context. He's never seen one before. To him, it would be scary. It would be very threatening. How does something fly that's not alive? All these type of things. That doesn't mean helicopters didn't exist because now we see them. So the argument goes in the opposite direction as well because John in Revelation would have seen all these things that we now see, but he would have had no way of describing them. So he used the best literary terms he could have in his current context. Okay, um, the next question is um, how, no, what, no, do, where'd that question go? Anyway, it got taken down, okay. Uh, d here's the question, do homosexuals have a place in this church? Would you make them renounce their ways? Oh my. Well, I'm not a pastor here, so I don't have to answer that one. <laughs> well, I, do you want to... I, I, I can answer for the, for the church. Okay, this church, church, and yeah. I'll answer for this <laughs> church. Know, just, um, homosexuality is, through the Old Testament, New Testament, seen as an abusive lifestyle. Both in often the way the lifestyle pours out and in just the damage to the body. So that is really the big stickler. The person doesn't change. Jesus died for every single one of them, every single one of us. Whether you are in a position where things are not going in the direction that you thought. There are many people, and this is the thing, there are many people who have things that they want to do that they don't let people know about. The fact about, just, just to be on the side, the homosexual discussion is so large because it's, you just can't hide it the same way. I always felt bad as a pastor for the people that smoked because you could pick on them because everyone saw them outside the parking lot smoking. That's just not fair because we all have things that we know we don't want people to know. So the reality is, is that God loves every single person and every single person is gifted and graced the same way. What the Bible and the church would want is the behavior to change by trusting God the same way he does that to everything one else. That has damage, that causes damage. He wants that, uh, that's to me the crux of it. Yeah, so just to, for me, um, probably the best book I've ever read on this is a book called Messy Grace. Uh, it's by a guy by the name of K uh, Caleb Kaltenbach. Um, and really, the thing we have to understand is, is go back to the core scripture that everyone has sinned and have fallen short of the glory of God. So what that means is that there is a truth, but it also means that we live in grace, and so we have to apply grace as well. Um, Old and New Testament, as Dennis said, uh, it is very clear that homosexuality is a sin, but so is lying, so is um, abuse, so are all these other things. And so what we have to make sure that we do is that we speak truth in love. It doesn't mean we love them less, it doesn't mean we apply grace less, but it also means that we have to speak the truth when we are given the opportunity to do so. Um, so f for me, it's, it all comes down to relationship. Right? I think one of the biggest mistakes that the church, I wouldn't say necessarily this church, but the church has made is the fact that they have spoken truth outside of love and outside of grace uh, and instead of inside relationship. For me, if I've got a problem with my friend or if I've got a problem with my son or daughter or with my wife, I'm not going to go to the street corner and throw a giant sign up that says, my wife is a sinner. 
right? I'm going to go to them in person and I'm going to deal with them in love and grace. And I think the truth, the same needs to be applied for every single person that walks through the door of the church, regardless of what sin they're, they're dealing with. Yeah, great answer. And so for me, um, uh, you know, I, I don't really like the word gay or homosexuality. Uh, I think a better way to describe it is same sex attraction, same sex attraction. And when you look at it from that context, we're attracted to all kinds of things. Uh, we have um, godly attractions, holy attractions, but we also have sinful attractions. So for us as a church, we would view homosexuality, same-sex attraction, as an unbiblical precedent. Uh, there's really two things that are sacred to God. That's creation or culture. Culture, ethnicity, is, is, is a sacred thing. How God made us uh, is sacred. All the different nations, the different colors, red, yellow, black, and white, that is sacred. But then the second thing that is sacred is our sexuality. And God is very clear in the scriptures. He created us male and female. That is a sacredness to God. And so any, any, any change in that, uh, to me, is not God's best. Now, that being said, we love everyone. We love everyone with holy attractions, and we love everyone with unholy attractions because we're all on a journey. And it is, as Sheldon said, grace. Uh, we have uh, time for one more. It's, boy, it's sure gone fast, eh? Wow. You might say, I didn't get my question in. Um, well, come back for the next service, because we'll be doing this all over again. Uh, what one shall we do? Um, what about number three? How do we know Christianity is true when there are so many firm believers in other religions. So, um. Um, I always like to, to state that we have one law of gravity. Pastor Dave, you have a law of gravity. Mine is the same. Truth sometimes is restrictive, and sometimes truth hurts. Christ came, Christ died, Christ rose, we know from the evidence of the resurrection. We know um, his, his prophetic nature, um, that Christ is the way to God. Um, there are firm believers in other religions, but again, it comes back to truth in itself will be restrictive. Uh, Christ says, enter through the narrow gate, for the road is wide that leads to destruction. So we're trying to find that truth in Christ and realizing that he is the truth. Because again, you can only have one truth. Two truths in our society nowadays, um, you know, they're both true according to the government. But when it comes to Christianity and when it comes to faith, this is the most difficult question that you have to face is who is Jesus and what are you doing with him? And for me, Christ makes Christianity true and the firm believers in other religions, well, we, that's, that's our mission. We have to, uh, we have to make, them, make them see who Christ really is and bring them, bring them into the light. I, I think for me, uh, just to play off of what um, William said, is Christianity defines itself so differently than every other religion that's out there in the fact that it's through the belief in Jesus and that's it. Uh, it is not works-based. Now, you analyze every other religion that is out there, and it is works-based. And for me, um, and this is something um, William and I actually emailed about, is uh, the fact that um, in a lot of ways, that I think is actually a more narrow restriction because you actually don't know whether or not you have achieved enough to meet the goal when you're based in, in works. Um, the fact is, is you're always, in some cases, uh, looking to a scorecard. Have I been good enough? And you'll never know. Um, and so for me, I actually think it takes way more faith to believe in those religions than it does in Jesus, because you never know if you're saved. You have no clue. You won't know until, um, well, you'll never know, really. Even to, that, to the point of the day of your death, you will never know. But in Jesus Christ, you have that solid foundation that absolutely you do know without a shadow of a doubt. Uh, and to me, that actually is less narrow than some of the religious views out there. 
Um, and when you take all the religions, and you start going through the categories we've gone through a little bit, and you start narrowing them down to what's the most reasonable outcomes, it usually narrows down to the, the monotheism that become to be the, the best options, and then you have to take those three and start looking at them in different options, and Christianity still keeps being the most reasonable and provable aspect of them all. Truth by its nature is exclusive. You can't have truth and another truth. So therefore, all the religions can be wrong, but they all can't be right. And so their existence is that only one is. And I've been, I've been sincerely believing in things that were wrong in my past. I sincerely believed the wrong thing before. And that's what it comes down to. We can be, you can be a sincere believer in something, doesn't mean that the belief is true. If I sincerely believe that the bridge I'm about to cross will hold my weight, and then I walk across the bridge and it crumbles, I was sincerely wrong. My faith was in the wrong thing. But if I find that the bridge holds me, then my faith has true, proven to be affirmed, and it's the right thing to believe in. And that's what it comes down to. It's not what I feel and what I believe in by simply I want to, but it's what actually holds weight when the day is done. And often, in many other religions, it's cultural. If you're going to be in India, you have to be, they just assume you're going to be Hindu. And if you're not, they're wondering what's going on. And Christianity is one of the most widespread, non cultural, distinctive religion out there. It meets everyone where they're at. And so those are just other things I would add to what the scholars have said. Yes, the scholars. How many, how many have appreciated our scholars? Yeah. And so the time has flown, it really has, and we probably have a real pile up of questions. Uh, unfortunately, we just don't have the time to deal with all of them, but I think, I think uh, our panel did a pretty good job. How many think they, yeah. And so maybe we'll do this again, a part two, because uh, obviously there's tremendous interest in this. But uh, I want to encourage all of you to, uh, to, do, to do your due diligence. And to, uh, to do, to, I don't like you use the word research, but reading, reading, especially nowadays when people are looking for uh, answers uh, that aren't just pat answers, Christian answers. They're looking, they're looking for reasons for the hope, the faith that's in us. And, um, you know, last Sunday I did mention a, a great book, um, I forget the name, On Guard um, uh, is a fantastic book. Yeah. So, uh, so I would encourage you for some summer reading, uh, maybe pick some of this apologetic stuff up. Can I just add, like, so just for maybe resources, William Lane Craig's website is reasonablefaith.org. He's one of the master philosophers of our day, of true, noble. Uh, I would add re reasons to believe, some very interesting things there, um, and just R Ravi Zacharias, some very good apologetic yeah, very good. men. Yeah. yeah. Well, let's give our panel a big hand again. Thank you.